Uh, yeah, I've read it. I've read it. Okay, so we have so we have uh, quite a few people actually on the call uh, who have um, are familiar with the book. So excellent show of hands there. That that makes me feel a little bit better. Um, so structurally, uh, how I'm going to go over this is this way. I'm going to give a short background and biography of Camus. I'm going to talk a little bit about of some of his written output, uh, specifically where he considers the plague to fall within sort of his canon of writings, move into his notion of creating a new classicism. Then we'll move into a short synopsis of the book in five stages, take a little in-depth look at two of the characters in the book, examine two themes that recur in the novel, and then wrap it up with some final observations. Um, I'm not gonna talk for any more than a half an hour. Or so uh, if, you're, if you thought that was a lot to cover, I'm, I'm definitely trying not to bore you. Um, in putting this together, I felt using Camus' words, uh, albeit translated, were necessary to get the true feeling of the existential dilemma he's describing. So I will, you will have to bear with me because I do use three lengthy quotes in the talk, um, but I thought that they were really necessary to capture what he was saying. Um, we're all articulate on the phone. He is articulate par excellence. So, um, so to understand the book, um, it's necessary to understand a little bit about the bag, background and biography of Camus. Albert Camus was born in, on the 7th of November in 1913 in a small working class neighborhood in Mondovi, which is uh, present day Drian, which is a small coastal town in Algeria. Okay. His father, Lucien Camus, was a poor French agricultural worker who died at the Battle of the Marne in 1914 during World War I. Camus never knew him. Camus, his mother, and other relatives lived without many, many basic material possessions during his childhood in the Belcourt section of Algiers, which is an impoverished area. He was a second generation French in Algeria. His childhood poverty affected him much later in life, and he was diagnosed with, with tuberculosis, as, as many of you know, and it affected his writing and also his output and his, the way that he approached and thought about life. Camus moved um, from uh, Algeria to Paris. Can everybody see me? Yep. Okay. Camus, uh, however, the outbreak of World War II began to affect France. Camus took an active role in the underground resistance movement against the Germans during the French occupation. It was then that he started working as a journalist and editor of the banned newspaper Combat. Combat. He volunteered to join the army, but was not accepted because he suffered from tuberculosis. At, the way that Camus uh, approached writing was he wrote in literary cycles consisting of a novel, an essay, and a theatrical play. And he wrote these in five separate cycles. So after moving to Paris, he had completed, he completed his first cycle of works dealing with uh, the themes of absurd and meaninglessness the novel, which is called The Outsider in the UK or The Stranger in the US, the philosophical essay, The Myth of Sisyphus, and the play Caligula. And it was at this time he gained some notoriety and some celebrity um, in Paris at the time. As the Germans began marching towards Paris, uh, Camus had to flee. He, uh, because of that, he was laid off from his, his daytime job and ended up in Lyon where he married uh, pianist and mathematician Francine Foiré in 1940. And then they eventually moved back to Algeria, actually Iran, where the setting of this book is, where he taught in primary schools. Because of his tuberculosis, he was forced to move to the French Alps after that on medical advice. There he began writing the second cycle of works, this time dealing with revolt, including this novel, The Plague. So this is actually part of the second uh, uh, cycle of works for Camus. Camus died on the 4th of January 1960 in a car accident in northern France. He was 46 years old. Uh, he was the passenger in the car. There have been some, uh, there have been some things in the, in the paper saying that he maybe have killed himself due to the meaningless and absurdity of life, etc., which is totally antithetical to the way that Camus believes, but uh, some people were trying to make something of that. But again, he was, not the, he was not the driver of the car. He didn't commit suicide. 
So there's five themes that Camus um, wanted to address in, his in the cycles that he sketched out himself in his notebooks. So Camus wrote in notebooks, much like we have today, and they, they've been published. I have three volumes of his notebooks, and I use that to supplement the reading and the background of, 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 the, of the material that he's actually published. So the five themes that Camus talks about wanting to address are firstly, the absurd and courage in the face of meaninglessness, okay? And this was in the first cycle where he dealt with the stranger, the myth of Sisyphus, Caligula, and another essay, The, Under the Misunderstanding. Uh, the second cycle is called, he called the aesthetics of revolt. And this is where the plague falls, right? It's actually a novel about revolt. Uh, thirdly, judgment. Um, and that's where the book, The Fall, falls, uh, falls into. Fourth, he called Love Sundered. He never wrote anything in this area. So we never uh, had, we, we never, we don't have anything to, to understand what he meant by that. And then the fifth was Creation Corrected. And there was a book posthumously published called The First Man. And that's where he started to talk about that. But basically, we only have the three, three of the first five cycles of Camus' writings, the absurd, the aesthetics of result, revolt, and judgment. And those are his three main works. So if we look at the plague as, as a book and as aesthetics of revolt, the overarching of the theme is the impossibility for man to despair utterly. Okay, this is very important and it doesn't show up in the book. It shows up in his notebook several times. So I'm gonna repeat it again. The impossibility for men to despair utterly, okay? And Camus says that the, the remarkable thing in man is not that he despairs, but that, that he overcomes or forgets despair. The aesthetics of a revolt require that the literature of this despair is not universal. It has to be in a particular setting and universal literature cannot stop at despair, but merely takes despair into account, okay? And that's the reason why Camus wrote literature and not philosophy. It's why he considers himself an artist and not a philosopher. He thinks according to words and he doesn't think according to ideas, He's in, he narrates them. When Camus won the Nobel Prize for Literature in 1957, in his acceptance speech, he says, quote, that is why true artists scorn nothing. They're obliged to understand rather than to judge. And they have to take sides in this world. They can perhaps side only with that society in which according to Nietzsche's great words, not the judge, but the creator will rule whether he be worker or an intellectual. By the same token, the writer's role is not free from difficult duties. By definition, he cannot put himself today in the service of those who make history. He is at the service of those who suffer it. Otherwise, he will be alone and deprived of his art." End quote. From the point of view of creating a new classicism, something Camus was interested in his literary cycles via novel, essay, and play, his description of the human condition and our differing responses to it should be seen as the first attempt at, at, at quote, shaping a collective passion. So if we think about this sort of universal uh, goal that he has set to himself, very large, uh, in the Western canon, there is a description of pestilence in the so-called four horsemen of the apocalypse. So in the theme of the plague is about pestilence plague is a type of pestilence. And in the book of Revelation, we are giving an amazing description of, of these four horses and these riders. The first is commonly interpreted as the horse of pestilence. And that's the one I'm going to give you the, the, the description from in the book of Revelation. And, and I quote, I looked and there was before me a white horse. Its rider held a bow and he was given a crown and he rode out as a conqueror bent on conquest. And then the narrative goes into the other three horses, then it ends up, they were given power over a fourth of the earth to kill by sword, famine, and plague, and by the wild beasts of the earth. And so with this description in sort of the consciousness of people in Western civilization, it's gonna be a pretty tough act for Camus to follow, but he's gonna, we're gonna give it a try today. So I'm gonna start here with a little synopsis of the book, The Plague. Not a lot of detail, but I'm gonna give it a little synopsis for those who haven't read it, or for those who have read it in the past and want to sort of uh, 
understand where we're going to go with this. I, I, I map the book in set of five stages. Um, the first stage of the people of Iran, where they go into a denial of reality. Secondly, the, the people of Iran go into an indifference to the plight of others until it actually starts to affect them and their families. And then they move into a stage of a fear of isolation coupled with a period of suspicion of others. Uh, the fourth stage is a resistance to death, uh, which is called the great leveler. And then there is a period of relief when the plague actually ends. I'm gonna spend most of my time talking about the first three stages in the book. So the book starts out with, does anybody have any questions right now about anything that I've said? Am I, am I clear? Is it, am I coming through clearly? Yeah, it's all clear. All okay, clear. okay yep. good. Okay, so the plague um, is actually, there's an unnamed narrator in the book. And at the end, the narrator is revealed to actually be the main character, Dr. Rue, who goes through and, and um, for the 250 five pages is the one narrating the book. We find out at the end, he's actually the main character. And incidentally, and as an aside, um, in the book, The Fall, which is a monologue, uh, a monologue, the only person who speaks is the reply of the other person in the book. The narrator makes no comments in the book. So it's a book of, you never hear what the question is, you only hear what the answer is. That's in The Fall. I just thought it was very interesting that the narrator goes unnamed until the very end in this, another literary device um, that Camus uses. So the story begins with rats dying in this coastal community within the port city of Iran, which is in Algeria. Dr. Rue is the main character and he's introduced this way, quote, when leaving his surgery on the morning of April 16th, Dr. Bernard Rue felt something soft under his foot it was a dead rat lying in the middle of the landing. That's how we're introduced to the main character, okay? And so that's when we start to examine the first stage that we enter into the book, the stage of denial. The janitor says to the doctor, there are no rats in the building. He, 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 he's insisting as they're dying around him. He says, quote, there weren't no rats in here. And in vain, Dr. Rue says there was a rat and it was on the second floor landing. And Mr. Mr. Michel's conviction wasn't to be shaken saying, there weren't no rats in this building. So on the next day, April 17th at eight o'clock, the janitor catches the doctor as he's going out. And he says, some young scallywags, he said, have dumped three dead rats in the hallway. Unironically, Mr. Michel is the first character to die in the plague, okay? Then we move on to uh, the magistrate who is also in denial. He says, these rats now, these rats, they're nothing. He says to Dr. Rue, dismissing them as, as, as if they're not, not taking place. Meanwhile, the trash cans in Iran are getting piled up with, with uh, dead rats. We move into the second stage. That is the stage of indifference to, to the problem. People are carrying on with their daily activities, seemingly unconcerned that this disease has affected others and it hasn't affected them. However, it soon becomes apparent that it is a problem. Garbage cans are filling up with rats. People in town are getting nervous. That's a fact, Dr. Rue admitted. And of course, all sorts of wild rumors are going around. The prefect said to me, take prompt action if you like, but don't attract attention, unquote. He's personally convinced it's a false alarm. We were talking a little bit earlier before we started. It sounds very familiar, like the stance of a certain US president whose concerns were hidden from the public so as not to cause panic. The beginning of the pandemic, the same, same exact uh, stance was taken as it takes, takes in the book. A vaccine arrives uh, in this stage, and, but it's insufficient to, to treat everyone. Uh, a character in the book, Taru, who is a vacationer in the city, takes notes of the takes note of the increasing severity of the problem to Dr. Ru, and he pleads with him, saying, "Time is of the ex essence. The absurdity of the people not taking the disease, disease seriously starts to weigh on Taru and Dr. Ru as we move into the sort of third stage of the book, a stage that I call the fear of isolation and period of suspicion." 
the, 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 the third stage starts with, with this quote, once the gates were shut, everyone realized that all, the narrator included, were so to speak in the same boat and each would have to adapt himself to the new conditions of life, unquote. Uh, being a port community, Camus goes with the uh, literary reference of being in a boat. Uh, he, in the, fall, in the fall, says that we are in the soup together. So he has this concept that we are all experiencing the same thing and that no one is immune to this, while at the same time, people are refusing to admit that it is actually affecting them all. One man actually laments, laments that it's forbidden to spit on cats in plague time reminiscent of us walking around the streets here in Wimbledon. Another interjects, the thing he most detests is being cut off from others. People continue going to cafes and meeting with each other, especially spending time on, spending money on expensive meals and fine wines, anything to create the illusion of normalcy. People begin, begin becoming accused of carrying the plague. They want the doctor to issue a clean bill of health. To what end? to stop the suspicion that they are carrying the plague and for some to have the necessary documents to attempt to leave the city. This is when we move into the fourth stage of, uh, of, of the novel, what I call resistance and death, the great leveler. And I'm gonna start with first of three, the three lengthy quotes, but this is uh, where uh, I, I was not able to say it better than Camus. And this is quote, that too is why this epidemic has taught me nothing new except that I must, must fight it at your side. I know positively, yes, Rue, that I cannot say that the world inside out, as you may see, that each of us has the plague within him. No one, no one on earth is free from it. And I know too that we must endless, keep endless watch on ourselves lest in a careless moment we breathe in somebody's face and fasten the infection on him. What's natural is the microbe. All the rest, health, integrity, purity is a product of the human will, of a vigilance that must never falter. The good man, the man who infects hardly anyone, is the man who has the fewest lapses of attention and it needs tremendous willpower and never ending tension of the mind to avoid such lapses. Yes, Rue, it's a wearying business being plague stricken, but it's still more wearying to refuse to be it. That's why everybody in the world today looks so tired. Everyone is more or less sick of the plague. But that is also why some of us, those who don't, who want to get the plague out of their systems, feel such desperate weariness, a weariness from nothing remains, from which nothing remains to set us free except death. At this point, the character, unquote, at this point, the characters are acknowledging the absurd, the absurd impossibility of winning this struggle, but they have to struggle anyway. Only in knowing their common futility can, can the individuals begin to act with self-meaning and with community. And this is when uh, it reminded me of the great English poet, uh, James Shirley, the, the poem, Death the Leveler, um, came into mind. This is not in the book, but, and I'm only going to read the first verse to you. The glories of our blood and state are shadows, not substantial things. There is no armor against fate. Death lays his icy hand on kings. Scepter and crown must tumble down and in the dust be equal made with the poor crook's sigh and spade. And it is this point in the novel that people begin to die in mass and get get buried in mass graves and it reminds me of the of the encounter between the great philosopher diogenes the, the founder of stoicism and alexander the great when he visited athens to meet diogenes alexander the great found the philosopher diogenes looking attentively at a pile of bones and he said what are you doing? And Diogenes explained, I am searching for the bones of your father, but cannot distinguish them from, from those of a slave. And in the end, we, were, we are all the same and we will all die the same. 
The final, and the, the final piece of the book is a stage five, which I call the relief, where the community begins to come together. They see their collective plight, they accept it. And at this point, the plague subsides, preparations are made to celebrate, people are looking forward to uh, life returning to normal. So before wrapping up the synopsis of the book, I wanna take a little bit deeper of a look into two characters in the book. There's, there's, there's quite a few characters in the book, probably a dozen. I want to take a look at two of them specifically. Um, and then I want to talk uh, and then sort of end it, end this part of it with a quote. There's a character called Raymond Rambert, who is a visitor to the town. And he is a journalist. Um, and his newspaper is one of the leading Paris daily newspapers had commissioned him to make a report on the living conditions prevailing among specifically the Arab populations and especially on the, on the uh, sanitary conditions in Iran. The newspapers are daily rallying the popu populace that the pestilence is under control when it's actually not. And Raymond feels like he doesn't belong there at all and he wants to escape. He doesn't want to stay in Iran. He wants to go back to Paris. And he says to the doctor, he says, quote, you'll soon be talking about the interests of the general public, but public welfare is merely the sum total of the private welfares of each of us. A compelling argument, uh, one that Camus actually refutes. So the doctor does agree. However, he takes ownership of fighting the plague as his personal problem. He is a doctor after all. And he continues to convince Rambert that the plague is everyone's problem. Therefore, Ryu has to act in the face of this absurd situation by staying and helping the very citizens he is, he has, um, he is caring for. After many discussions, in the end, Ryu's word, man is not an idea, and that he is not a hero convinces Rambert who gives up his efforts to flee Iran and join the collective fight against the common enemy. And as with any good novel, we see a little of ourselves, not in one specific character, but a little of ourselves in many characters. Uh, there's uh, a lot to be seen in this character. The second character I wanna look at is the, re the religious figure in the novel, Father Panelo. And on Sunday, in a high mass celebrated under the auspices of St. Roche, Father Panelo gives a sermon to ostensibly calm the society. He is, however, quote, a champion of Christian doctrine at its most precise and purest, equally remote from modern laxity in the obscurantism of the past, unquote. He has also broadened his, he has also broadened his Jesuit reach by a series of public lectures on present day Individualism, individualism. Sound familiar to anyone? Having made clear that this plague came from God for the punishment of their sins, he exhorts the gathering to fall on their knees, pray, and repent. However, as Dr. Rue says, pestilence isn't a thing made to man's measure. Therefore, we tell ourselves that pestilence is a mere bogey of the mind, a bad dream that will pass away, but it doesn't pass away. And from one bad dream to another, it is men who pass away and the humanists, first of all, because they haven't taken their precautions. Again, does this sound familiar? The townspeople all group together in a corner in front of a makeshift altar on which stands the statue of Saint Roche, patron saint to pray to during times of pestilence carved in haste by one of the local sculptors. When suddenly about halfway through the book, one of Dr. Rue's patients recovers from the plague, but then children begin to die. And at the deathbed of one of the children, Father Panelo cries out, my God, spare this child. Since joining Rue's band of workers, Panelo had spent his entire time in hospitals and places where he came in contact with the plague. He had elected for the place among his fellow workers that he judged incumbent on him in the forefront of the fight and constantly since then, he had rubbed shoulders with death. He was theoretically immunized by periodical inoculations. He was well aware that at any mo moment, death might claim him too, and he had given thought to this. Outwardly, he had lost nothing of his serenity, but from that day on in which he saw the child die, something seemed to change in him. 
He is then asked to give a second sermon, which differs from the first. He says, quote, my brothers, a time of testing has come for us all. We must believe everything or deny everything. And who among you, I ask, would dare deny everything, unquote. He then becomes ill, refuses treatment, relies on his faith and dies holding a crucifix against his breast. Ironically, Dr. Rue says, it is doubtful that Father Panelu died of plague. It's notable at this point um, that Camus describes the plague in his notebooks as a tract, which is a tract is a short treatise um, on typically on a religious subject. Uh, so religion is actually playing quite the role here because at the deathbed, the priest's words have no consolation to, to the hearers in the room or to the actual readers of the book. And in the notebooks, Camus tells a story of prisoners being forced to dig two holes in the ground, uh, probably for their own graves. But after digging through the roots and everything for two hours, the guards told, tell them to fill the holes back in and they are taken back to the prison. This is how Panelu feels about the observations of some of the people in town being forced to watch people get sick and then subsequently die. There's nothing that can be done outside of the divine. It is an absurd situation on the face of it. And his only consolation is to, is to give into death with no resistance. And at the end of this, uh, at the end of this uh, section in the book, there is a, an entry summarized the feelings of those who feel otherwise than Panelu and are giving resistance. And this is the second lengthy quote that I have. Teru agreed this might be so. Still, he thought it wiser to count on the opening of the gates and to return to normal life in the near future. Granted, Cotter rejoined, but what do you mean by a return to normal life? Teru smiled. New films at the picture houses. But Cotter didn't smile. Was it supposed, he asked, that the plague wouldn't have changed anything and that the life of the town would go on as before, exactly as if nothing had happened? Teru thought that the plague would have changed things and not changed them. Naturally, our fellow citizens' strongest desire was and would be to behave as if nothing had changed. And for that reason, nothing would be changed in a sense. But to look at it from another angle, one can't forget everything, however great one's wish to do so. The plague was bound to leave traces anyhow in people's hearts. To this, Cotter rejoined curtly that he wasn't interested in hearts. Indeed, they were the last thing he bothered about. What interested him was knowing whether the whole administration wouldn't be changed, lock, stock, and barrel. Whether, for example, the public services would function as before. Thoreau had to admit he had no inside knowledge on the matter. His personal theory was that after the day, the upheaval caused by the epidemic, there would be some delay getting these services underway again. Also, it seemed likely that all sorts of new problems would arise and necessitate at least some reorganization of the administrative system. Cotter nodded, yes, that's quite on the cards. In fact, everyone will have to make a fresh start. And at this point, I want to go back to a theme that we had been talking to, uh, talking about for the past year in the Philosophical Society, and that was the theme of the common book. And um, I did pass around the link to everyone on this call. Um, the theme, this theme has been addressed in the little book of the common good, an ongoing treatise started by Leslie, who I see is on the phone and friends. And it discusses on how to reorganize what we currently know in society for the greater good. Something that Camus said was a necessary outcome of having gone through the plague. Something that we should consider in the society. So there's two themes that, uh, <clears throat> that are presented in the book that we would consider as ex existential themes, existential would be ex ex existentialism being a philosophical theory which emphasizes the existence of the individual person as free and responsible agent determining their own development through acts of the will, rather than act, being passively act upon, being an active engagement in the outcomes of your own life. When addressing 
the topic of uh, the first theme is death. When addressing the topic of death, Camus talks about the one fundamental question of existentialism. He called it the problem of suicide. He wrote, there is really only one seriously philosophical question and that is of suicide. He viewed the question of suicide as arising naturally as a solution to the absurdity of life. However, it is very important to note that Camus re rejects suicide as the answer to the absurdity, but rather the courage to live within this existential angst is the correct attitude. Not just live, but to act. Acting bravely in the face of an absurd world is the obligation and duty of humankind. This does not make someone a hero, but rather makes us human beings. The second <clears throat> existential theme that, that is raised in, in the book is the idea, the, the idea of, of freedom is gained through acts of rebellion. Camus was interested in, in freedom, obviously uh, rebelling against the German occupation in France. His work in the resistance news, newspaper Combat exemplified that. He wrote many articles about this. Freedom is achieved through active rebellion. He was describing the, Camus was describing the human condition exemplified by the nexus of significant individuals tending to everyday people, people like you and me, someone like me holding my wife, hugging my children, kissing my parents. And I can't explain this in my own life outside of the, outside of the actual act of me flying out of England back to New York and kissing the ground when the plane arrives. It's a visceral feeling, one that can only be explained when freedom is secured, a familial feeling, an anticipating of seeing my family after a long recess in a familiar place, one that occurs perhaps after a, after a plague. As always, there's a bit of deep reading, one that occurs after engaging in ethereal description of such the human condition. Camus describes us and sometimes prescribes us. For Camus, freedom, and <clears throat> freedom, the prescription of the aesthetics of revolt is principally determined by the community. It's very important. The aesthetics of revolt is principally determined by the community. And in the preface to the book, Camus actually uh, uses a quote by the author Daniel Defoe, and it, and it goes, it says this, it is as reasonable to represent one kind of imprisonment, imprisonment by another as it is to re represent anything that really exists by that which exists not. And so I would ask, is this novel so different than what we are collectively experiencing now? Are we not in the same boat? Is fiction really that much different from the facts of human experience? In the end, the plague, in the end, the plague uh, finishes and people begin returning to their normal daily routines. However, Camus warns us a return to normality without, active, without actively resisting the urge to change society for the better is short-sighted. And this is the final uh, quote uh, that I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to read, the third and final quote. And indeed, as he listened to the crowds of joy rising from the town, Ryu remembered that such joy is always imperiled. He knew that those jubilant crowds did not know what he could have, what could have learned, been learned from books, that the plague basilisk never dies or disappears for the good, that it can lie dormant for years and years in furniture and linen chests, that it bides its time in bedrooms, cellars, trucks, and bookshelves, and that perhaps the day would come when for the bane and enlightening of men, it would rouse up in its rats again and send them forth to die in a happy city. And that is the final, the final line of the plague. I got a few more comments uh, to make in conclusion. There's an entry in one of Camus' notebooks from July of 1945, which has always resonated with me um, since uh, I first read it. 
And it and it's a sentence that says, the man I should be if I had not been the child I was. <laughs> and as a child suffering from tuberculosis, his family too poor to really help him, he wanting his wanting to serve in the army, but being kept from doing so due to his illness. Camus was a man of, of pr profound conviction. He spent his time actively writing during the French resistance, doing the only thing that he could possibly do. He also was a stranger in a strange land, an outsider from Algeria fighting an evil, knowing that this was the essence of being human when he was in France. So in conclusion, we touched on some major stages in the the major stages of the plague, denial of reality, people in denying reality, people moving from indifference to the plight of others until it actually affects them and their family, moving then into a fear of isolation and a period of suspicion of others. Finally, in acts, acts of resistance to death, the great leveler, and then a relief. We talked about two existential themes in the book, the theme of death, and the theme of freedom is achieving is be freedom achieved through acts of rebellion, and so two final things that I I want to say to take that we are trying to take away from here in conclusion, number one, many times we don't have the answers. Sometimes we encounter things that we have never experienced, and those are the times that we need to consider these things together. And secondly, societal obligations in a time of pandemic are placed under a microscope since the things that we do have direct consequences for others. The concept of common good has real life applications. The concept of common good has real life application, not in a theoretical sense, but during a common pandemic a lot, it has real meaning in a life death sense. Thank you very much again to Mark and the committee for having me uh, do, uh, present this to, to uh, the Wimbledon Philosophical Society. And one final comment I wanna say, there is a Camus muse that actually used to live here in Wimbledon. I hope everybody on the phone knows this, but I'll tell you, Schopenhauer, um, used to live over in Eagle House. There's a plaque over there. He was actually one of the favorite author, authors of Albert Camus. Uh, right here in Wimbledon, he used to live along with our other local celebrity, Robert Graves, and probably others that I'm not aware of yet. But uh, just for everybody's knowledge, Schopenhauer did used to also live here as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, I mean, that was, that was great. Ed. Thank you. Um, well, one of the things I noticed about the, um, when reading the book, um, it, um, it's very much a kind of a place under attack. Um, and you get that sense that the, um, uh, the people, um, in, in the town are, um, have that feeling that it, this is happening to them and it's, it's not happening to anybody else, which of course is very different to coronavirus, which is kind of, you know, which is a global pandemic rattling its way around the world, affecting different places in different, in different ways. I mean, how, how, do, how do you feel? Yeah. What, do you, what do you feel about that? Uh, well, that's one of, one, of the, one of the five stages that, you're, that we're talking about, right? There's this whole concept that people uh, reject it as something that isn't occurring to them, that is, they're indifferent to it until it actually does start to affect them, right? And I think that that's really the case. I mean, I guess uh, it'd be better for others to chime in here because I've said what I have to say, but I think that's really the case. People don't take it seriously until somebody that they know has died from it. Uh, what, do, what do others think? Yeah. Yeah. Human nature. Uh, I think that's definitely the case that we're all under siege in a way. Uh, even so, it's it's a, a, a global siege. Um, and, uh, and I think um, it's quite amazing that Camus could describe it so so well and, and all these uh, stages that um, as you said, we, we are actually going through from um, denial to 
solidarity, you know, um, sort of, um, I, I just remember little chestnut solidarity, all clapping and, and supporting each other. And, and then comes the next stage, doesn't it, of one is being tired of sort of besieged uh, by it all. And, and, and also the huge warning sign of, of death, the, the leveler and, and the cruelty of it. Um, yeah, I only read the book when I was at school, but I remember the very eerie um, ending and, and the beginning that it's still lurking there. And even once we get out of it, um, you know, we could still get into a very similar situation again. Yes. Uh, Brian? Well, it would be for Shauna. I see the hand. <laughs> um, I think people have to have a feeling of empathy. If they don't have a personal um, situation where they know somebody who's died of it or in the hospital or everything, if they don't know it, then you're right. They're, they're sort of distance from it. But you have to feel for that other person. And lately have been like on BBC and everything, people are telling their stories. And you're seeing the people in the hospital. And then the, the one last night, the lady died the next day. And once you, if you have a feeling of empathy towards other people, then maybe you will be part of the community that will do these regulations and wear the mask and everything else. But if you don't have a feeling of this, then you're thinking of yourself all the time. And say, so, oh, I don't know anybody. So, you know, let her, you know, tough luck. You know, I'm going to go out without a mask and I'm going to do this. We know a lot of people, I mean, not a lot, but we know people who, just don't have a clue that it's happening. Not they know it's happening, of course, enough publicity and, and, and news, but they don't feel that it's happening. And they won't, they won't stick by all these rules. I mean, it just infuriates me that they phone. And I I go to the supermarket when I see somebody not wearing one, <laughs> I go for them. You know, I said, why aren't you wearing them like you're like this, you know, mask and all this kind of stuff? And they look at me, you know, like, who am I to tell them what to do? You know, mm. you just don't get so angry with these other people who don't feel for other for the community for what they're doing is wrong. Sorry to go on. <laughs> you're lucky you're not beaten up. <laughs> <laughs> Next. Can I make a small comment? Who is that, Leslie? Hello. It's Leslie, can I just say a few words? Because I'm being called to do something else. Uh, I want to say thank you, Ed, for a deeply interesting uh, talk and examination of Camus. Just as a footnote, I lived in Algeria for four years from 1960 to 1964, when that terrible, terrible war was going on uh, between the, uh, the Arabs and the French. And it was a period of the most intense uh, violence and hatred. So the values were absolutely opposed and polarized. And all I can say is that Algiers never returned, despite the solution, to any kind of peaceability, even to this day. Mm. So that's the first observation. The second is your, your comment, and I appreciate it very much about the common good, because obviously I believe absolutely that the common good is a philosophy or a way forward of thinking, which avoids the kind of confrontation that Camus experienced uh, in Oran, that Algiers experienced, and indeed every other place that's got itself into violent conflict. So the common good is essentially about the alignment of opposites in some search for a common sacred. And I can't think of a higher principle to extol and approve uh, than that. And I'm delighted that you've brought it up in today's discussion. So thank you very much. Yeah, for that. No, thank you for the comments. Uh, I've never been to Algeria. I don't know what it's like. Uh, I've, the only place I've lived is through Camus' work. So I'd like to have uh, be nice to have further discussions with you about what it was what it was like.
in Algeria. Thanks, I'd, thanks for the I'd welcome, I'd welcome that. I will. Thank you. Peter, is that you raising your hand? No, it's Mary here. Oh, Mary. Um, I, I was My going to pick up on the, the question of the common good. And I, I was just thinking that, you know, human beings don't live in a vacuum. Does the idea of a common good um, rest on leadership? Because what we're experiencing in this pandemic has been um, a lot to do with leadership to people's behavior. Um, so that's one point. I was wondering, what, I haven't read the book, but I wonder what Camus says about leadership in, in the plague. Uh, so there's a there's uh, there are several characters in the novel who are actually in leadership positions. Um, there is one in the town. Uh, there's also the vaccine, which is being developed out of town in Paris and being sent to Algeria. Um, it's interesting um, that the book is paralleling what actually, in my mind, has happened. Uh, the, the reaction is almost like someone read the book and thought that this is how you should act during a pandemic. Um, there's a denial at the very beginning that it is even something that should be addressed, very similar to what Trump said, you know, give it an election cycle and it'll go away. Uh, when we find out in retrospect that he very well knew how, how, actual, how deadly the pandemic really was going to become. Um, there are uh, the theme of resistance during uh, to the absurdity of, of what is happening is a major theme in the writings of Camus. And we are called to act to resist against the absurd, absurdness, absurd, absurdity of the human condition. And that's what makes us fully human. Um, people that shrink away from that responsibility or people that put it off on uh, you know, something else in this, in this sense, Father Panelo, a divine being, uh, are essentially shirking their responsibilities to the community, and they're not being uh, they're not being good citizens, and ultimately they're not being faithful to themselves. So you do have an absence of leadership, and I think this is by design in the book. I don't know if anyone else has any more comments around that. Do we have any? Ed, counselors. I, oh, okay. Yeah. Ed, yeah, um, yeah. it's Val. I, I just found that everybody blamed the authorities the whole time. The authorities, whatever they did, were always in the wrong throughout the book. And the other comment I would make on that is at the end of the book, I, I didn't get the feeling that the townspeople were going to go back to, they were just going to go straight back to what they were doing before. I don't think they had learned anything at all. And they didn't give you the impression that they'd learned anything or, or looked after each other in, in any better way than, than before the, the, um, the plague hit. It was, um, it was a very depressing book. I, mean, I did remember reading it literally 40 years ago at university and forgotten all about it. So I was quite glad to read it in English this time. So maybe I just didn't understand it in French, um, but it was a very depressing book. Thanks. <laughs> yes. There's no, I found no uplift and I was expecting to be, to, to, to feel something that would lift my spirit to say, yes, there's hope at the, you know, there, there's hope for the future when we've been through this. And I didn't find it at all in but, the book. But surely it wasn't the hope, wasn't the hope that things were gonna go back to normal in the book. Yeah, but they were bypassing the, 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 the absurdity of that. It's never gonna go back to normal. It can't go back to normal. But why can't it? I, I don't know. Yeah. yeah. Just the, certainly the impression. Because I think that's what's happening now, uh, that a lot of people just want it to end. And some people see it as a, as a, as a, as a way to reset society, whatever. Uh, uh, the vast majority of people, I would suggest, just want to get on with their lives. Mm -hmm. And, and for it all I, play. I think Anne wanted to say something. Anne? Ava? Oh. I was going to say that I question whether going back to normal is actually an improvement. Yeah, well, I think well, you're... That's another question. <laughs> yeah. That is the point, for sure. That is the point, yeah. 
Well, the, char the character of Dr. Rio was uplifting. He was the narrator and his voice all the way through. Um, he was a strength. I found the book extremely depressing for the first um, third or even two thirds of it. And then as I read through again, this, having read it in the past and been unable to stomach it, I read it this time. And by the end, I, I felt that the doctor had really given the leadership. Yeah, you're spot on with that analysis. The, the doctor is the leader. Yeah, can I perhaps come back to the idea of denial um, and this, the, the thought that um, Shoshana put forward that actually denial <clears throat> is is really kind of people who don't who don't really understand. I'm not sure that's I'm not sure I entirely agree with that. I think that there is a kind of there is definitely with coronavirus and and, and within the plague there is elements there are elements within society people who who are in denial of of the problem. Um, but are they just people who haven't? Um, experienced um you know haven't got it or haven't um, had people or known people um, it's made it go dark. Got it. i mean if you take if you take the american experience ed with trump you know those huge rallies that people had um where you know right in the middle of the of the pandemic you know huge rallies of thousands of people meeting i would just wonder you know how many people um in that that, that are in denial about a coronavirus um I, I, I don't think they're as much in denial as they don't perceive a risk to themselves. Because unlike the in the play, which I assume in the Camus book, uh, it was a, a form of the Black Death, which in the, in the old days would kill 50% of people. This is a different uh, pandemic. It affects, so we know, the very old and, and the ill. And there are vast ways of the population that don't feel as much at risk as, say, people in our age group. And I think that 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 that, that, that is a and, and what has been I think uh, interesting is the way that uh, the, uh, that we all obey the rules. We are a very law-abiding nation. Um, now, how long that will continue when the death toll falls, falls, we have to see. But I, but I think it's not. It it, it is a, a very odd, not an odd, but it is a different disease to the ones that perhaps we we saw as plagues in the past. But is, but is denial uh, the opposite to empathy? There are people who are in denial. Are they? Because somebody mentioned empathy, and you know, if you feel for other people, um, it's not that I might die of, die of this pain, but I might I might be a carrier. I might give it to other people. I mean, there are people out there who are more vulnerable. And I wonder I wonder if there is a kind of like a if there is a, like a dichotomy between you know denial and empathy and common good, as it were. I, I can I say that I reckon you brought up uh, Mark. You brought up Trump stuff. Um, he's in denial of every, everything, and the people in America that follow him are they're in denial of uh, global warming, of of uh, of course COVID, uh, of uh, all manner of things. It, and it's that is another global disease which might maybe we can uh, address some other time. Poss yeah, possibly that's a topic for another discussion. <laughs> Meanwhile, it all went quiet. Could I say another thing? Thank you very much, Ed, for um, you know uh, bringing up a subject which so closely uh, aligns with what we're all thinking about now. Um, Shoshana and I are in lockdown, and um, we, we we're sort of wondering what to do, but we're so damn busy. Um, <laughs> Doing bugger all, maybe, but we're very busy. Um, so it was interesting to to to. Uh, I hadn't read the book, but I did a quick whiz through earlier on today, and I, I noted that Taru added, "quote query How contrive not to waste one's time? Answer by being fully aware of it all the while." Da 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 da. Um, and uh, that was pretty philosophical, I thought, for a philosophical society. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> how, about, how about the guy that passes time by transferring peas from one pot to another? <laughs> I was like, what is this guy doing? <laughs> Ed, he was just hungry. He just wanted to know when his dinner was ready. <laughs> yeah, <I was> like, <laughs>
Or he just lived for the moment. Yeah. <laughs> but isn't, isn't the, the whole um, idea of um, Camus' plague, um, it, it doesn't really matter what kind of um, disease uh, or, or uh, one is be beleaguered with. It, it's the, the basic concepts, isn't it, of, of uh, like you mentioned before, it, uh, of uh, freedom um and solidarity and 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 personal um i think camus calls it a revolt uh, which isn't the the you know the right translation i i think in in english for it it's just a um, a change of attitude and a, a, a progressive change isn't it but it is, yes veronica it is i think but uh, is that revolt um collective individualism as opposed to collective um, uh, feelings of well-being and community, uh, wanting to help other people. So, for example, in in uh, Holland, you've got riots, anti-vaccination mm. riots. Uh, I mean, it's been quite poorly reported, but you know, basically, it seems to me that people who are fed up with too much, you know, being told what to do, are um, uh, you know, burning cars and uh, smashing windows. Um, but is that, is that a collective action or is that an outburst of individualism, people expressing their desire for freedom? Uh, well, I think it's a collective outburst uh, fueled by awareness uh, of, of the concept of freedom because a lot of, of the freedom we, we had, um, you know, last year still, um, or the beginning of the pandemic um, is, is gone, isn't it? And we basically also have to um, um, curb our lives and, and, and go in a different direction of, of um, it's, it's life is slower, isn't it? And more intense and maybe also more aware. Um, and, um, and I think denial and awareness are quite uh, linked as well. I think there has been a massive um, repression of freedom. I mean, to you know, it would not. Um, and um, uh, I thought I was going to say um, it'd be interesting uh, to see just how how quickly that breaks down because the the authorities at the beginning uh, didn't think they could lock down a population like any population in Europe, and it was only when the Chinese did. And they did it quite brutally, nailing up people in some cases. And then the Italians did it first. And then they realized that they could. And they had more or less done it for the last year. And I think it's going to be very interesting to see when the death tolls, which mercifully are starting, starting to come down very marginally, but when they really fall, when um, uh, the 80-year-old uh, people are um, uh, inoculated. Um, then the death toll may well fall by 85% within six weeks. And it'd be very interesting to see whether any form of lockdown then holds. As you say, in, 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 in the Netherlands, it hasn't been reported, but there have been these riots. Mm. There have been other outbreaks anyway. You know, and we saw it in, in places like Liverpool, where people were congregating. Um, because I just don't think that once, you, once the death toll comes down, I just think the lockdown's over. Mm. That would be my view. Others might have a different view. Mm. I think that once the vaccination becomes much more general, that's when the lock, that's when the danger comes, because will people care for others enough to realize that they can still carry it and infect, or will they just say, well, I'm okay, Jack, so that's all right. Well, I think there'll be a move, Lord Sumpton talks about this, there'll be a move when uh, towards anybody who feels threatened, it will be for them to isolate and not to expect the rest of society to isolate from them. And I think there'll be, there'll be a move towards saying that if you are still feel at risk, you, 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 after a while, you can't expect everybody else to um, be in isolation uh, to keep you safe. Uh, and I think that will come, the tipping point, when, all of, uh, when the vaccinations kick in and the death toll hopefully comes right down. Mm. I think that's very likely, and that, that's what the concept uh, Kambi was addressing as well, isn't it, of, of solidarity and the build-up of solidarity and the crumbling uh, of solidarity. That's what you just mentioned. But the solidarity won't be necessary uh, for, that, for that reason, because um, uh, 
the number of people at risk will have got, will have will have diminished considerably. That it's that there will be this then political um, decision, it'll be a political decision rather than medical decision. Um, how long do we keep a lockdown, which is costing the earth literally? How long do we keep that going uh, in order to protect people when the number that need protecting have come right down? Um, mm. And that'll be yeah, the that's uh, not uh, what, yeah. That's not what Camus was talking about, wasn't he? He wasn't talking about uh, political um, solidarity. He was just talking about the human uh, condition. Um, but uh, you know, obviously, it's a very valid point uh, that you're making. But, um, and, but and I think we will need that solidarity in a different way. It's solidarity looking after people who have financially suffered so badly, not just mm -hmm. health-wise, but the mm -hmm. people who are financially suffering. I've just had another call, uh, a WhatsApp group. Can you can you um, put put something out for the food bank? You know that that's mm. still going on, and, and we forget that the uh, economic. Well, we shouldn't forget how how bad the economic effects have been, as well as the health effects. Um, so the solidarity will still be needed for us to help people who are in dire financial straits. Um, we don't see it so much here in <laughs> the beautiful Wimbledon suburbs. I think Ed's mentioned that before. It's a strange little place, isn't it? This, um, but um, certainly, you know, in other parts of the country, it's um, it, it is really bad. Mm. Uh, Michael? Just to add, there's a very interesting article in the current edition of Prospect on the parody of food banks uh, from the perspective of people at the Trestle Trust who run a lot of food banks resisting uh, grants of substantial size from government, 35 million odd, on the grounds that food banks should not be part of our environment. They should not be an accepted part of our community activity. They are the result of attrition. They're the result of a temporary adversity. And, uh, and it's, it gets to complacency. Uh, and I think that one of the things that Camus addresses in the book is the notion of human complacency when faced with something that it doesn't really know what to do with. Mm. What, um, what do you, you mean? By, what do you mean by complacency in that context, Michael? Well, it's it's a bit like uh, Nassim Taleb's notion of the black swan in his book of that name. Things, you know, you wouldn't think that swans could be black if you just saw white swans all the time. So when something comes along that isn't that recognisable or you have no previous experience of dealing with, and you're a human race which has more recently got used to being able to fix everything, either medically, economically, or in other sorts of ways, it completely throws you. Completely throws you. Governments, leaders, groups, societies, groups like ours, we wonder what the hell can we do? And, and there are vaccinations and people think, well, that'll, that'll, that'll sort it out. So the virus uh, varies and changes and adapts and, and, and suddenly you discover that actually it's a bit like the old playground game of putting your hand on this. As soon as you put one hand down, it, something else happens. And it, it seems to me, maybe I'm being a bit cynical, but we are being caught out and it's a climate change thing as well. We're being caught out by our complacency. Simple as that. Yeah, I think that's that's the that's the ending, Michael. That's the ending of the book, right? I mean that that the rats will come. I, after again, I read it, right? but then I maybe I, I didn't. My French wasn't good enough at the time. Why? Because <laughs> I too read it originally in French as an undergraduate, right? Well, I'm saying, but that that's what Camus saying. You know that if you do become complacent and you do just act as if nothing had just happened, and we go back to normal life. Eventually, they will come back. We can fix this. Yeah, we will. We'll go back to some kind of normal. Yeah, uh, we can fix this. We have the mechanisms for doing it. Um, okay, so the doctors and nurses are all desperately, desperately exhausted, and we will run out of means at some point potentially. Oh no, the vaccine will stop it. But then people start to say, "Oh, but hang on a minute, just because." you've been vaccinated doesn't mean you are in entirely in the clear so human nature comes in again and you have to tell people hang on a minute don't throw your masks away yet oh but i was going to go out and party i've had the vac i should be fine no no it doesn't quite work like that not with something like a pandemic 
But I think that to be slightly more optimistic, the pandemic will decline because viruses do peak and we may well be seeing already the natural decline. Uh, herd immunity builds up, you have the vaccine. And of course you get variants. And what viruses often do, particularly coronaviruses, is that they vary to get through, but they become less strong because they don't want to kill the host. They want to infect as many people in their dying days. So I think that this virus will probably become like, you know, it'll become like flu. It'll always be around, but it'll be like a, a cold or a flu. Um, people will get vaccinated probably from it. It won't be, it'll fall from the headlines. And so I think that, right. I might be wrong, I might be wrong. It might, it might suddenly vary and, and kill 50%, but I think it's more likely in the history of viruses that this one will behave like that. And then it comes to the point where we are talking, well, what, do we just return to, uh, to normal? Do we just return to what went on before? Um, and that is, you know, a very interesting question that we'll... Sorry, I was, try, I was just trying to pull the threads together on the Camus point. I mean, I wasn't, I wasn't trying to be too pessimistic about our real current circumstances. Mm -hmm. But what I was trying to do was to feed back into Ed's interesting, very interesting mm -hmm. proposition. I mean, making that connection is an interesting one. Makes it gives you pause for thought, if nothing else. I mean, I really like the idea that the virus wants to do something. It's an interesting thing. It's like it has has its own <laughs> has its own will. It, it doesn't <laughs> want to kill. It doesn't want to kill the host. It wants to, and then when you start thinking about the virus wanting to do something for things, you know, it's, um, it's striving to do what it wants to do. And, uh, you know, we're, we're not being cooperative in that. It, but it's very intelligent, these viruses. Um, yeah, exactly. yes. It mutates, and it's intelligent, and it has different yeah. variants and, you know, can, can go in different directions. And you have the sense that actually the population wants to just go back to normal. We'd like to just get rid of this. And go back to go back to uh, to normality, and then and then we we believe actually that there, that will be the end of it, and there won't be another virus um, that in our lifetime. People keep talking about this, you know, once every hundred years, and this is a once in a hundred year event. Um, that would be nice, wouldn't it? So we believe that. So it's going to be something which is here now. And then we all go back to normal. We start flying all over the place and having holidays like crazy because we haven't been spending any money. So we've all got lots of cash to spend on lovely holidays. So we're going to start flying. Yeah. Over the covers. And then we do all that. We do all that stuff. And then suddenly another one comes in. And it's just, it, it, yeah, it may well come in. The viruses do. But we, it, is, it is the 100 year virus. The Spanish flu was the last major one. Uh, there may well be one coming along that we don't know anything about. But um, but that's really? life. But we, yeah. don't, we don't know, though, do we? I mean, no, we, we don't. don't. No, of course not. No. I mean, it's, they, it's an they, interesting they, test. At in least. The end of World War One, they said that's the war to end them all. Yeah, and then the flu came along. Yeah. Well, the flu came along, and then World War Two. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, Ed, may I, I know I'm not supposed to change the subject. I'm supposed to build on the conversation. But, um, Ed, you did say something about um, uh, looking at the religious influences or the religious side of the book as well. Could I ask one question about uh, Taro, who, who wanted to be a saint? And he said, Ken, but you don't believe in God. You can't be a saint if you don't believe in God. That, I mean, that really sort of stuck with me. I just wondered if you had a comment about, about that particular, well, about the character of Taro in that, in that sense as well, wanting to be a saint. And did he want to be a saint so that he could save the world and protect everybody from, from uh, uh, the plague? Well, I think he's an interesting character. You know, he was, if I was going to look at three characters, he would have been the uh, third yeah. character that I would have looked at um, because he is <laughs> the one who actively resists, right? He, yeah. he's, he's the leader of the resistance, so to speak. Um, and in, in the very end, he also dies, right? Mm -hmm. Pan Panelo dies and Taro dies, and they're antithetical to each other. The one who, you, you know, you're bringing up an interesting point because the one who has the faith in God so, uh, sort of allows himself to die w without ever resisting it, and Taro goes down fighting, right? Yeah. Just the opposite. Um, but, and then the question is the question that you're actually asking is who has the greater faith? Who has yeah. the greater faith here? Yeah. So I, I think that the, 
The reason why I chose Panelo is because Camus is, is, is actually writing a book, a religious book in a, in, a, in, a, in a real sense. And he makes this point, not in the book, but in his notebooks. And he wants to examine the role of religion in a pandemic. Um, and does, it doesn't seem um, from our reading of the book that that is the correct attitude to have, right? But rather Taru's attitude does, but yet he's an unbeliever. So I think this is a juxtaposition that Camus always is playing with, um, uh, that it creates a, a tension in our own mind, right? If, if, the, if the world is really absurd, why don't we just kill ourselves? Oh, well, we can't kill ourselves because we, we have to have courage in the face of this absurdity and that's what makes us human. So, comes back again, I think again to, you know, the, the different types of tensions that Camus brings up in his books and why I think they're so rich. Um, I can't really answer your question um, because I don't know if you can be a saint without having belief. I mean, that's a... No, Chris said he... That's, what I, that's exactly what Chris said. <laughs> we had a philosophical discussion about it last we night. We did, but oh, one, there you go. <laughs> one can be saint-like. Yes. <laughs> Well, that's good enough, isn't it? <laughs> well, the saints but, sit on the right hand of God in heaven, so <laughs> you can't have a saint unless you have God. Uh, well, yeah, I've, I find it interesting that um, the country that is uh, dealing best with the pandemic is the country that has, does not believe in God, i.e. China. They cope with it very, very well. I'm not saying I approve of it, Mm. Uh, that's what they do. Whereas people who actually do feel are empathetic um, are not coping terribly well, and it tends to be the liberal countries. The other thing about Camus, if I may, he was dealing with an epidemic, not a pandemic. There were few people there. He was also, he didn't have the World Wide Web. In his world, there was only one real world. We, our complications now lie because we have obviously a real terra, terra firma world and a virtual world which has come in the last 50 or so years. So we don't know sometimes what to believe on earth and what to believe you know, on social media. Therefore, it's easy for people to be in denial because they just go to social media and live a life in their own minds or in social media. So it, our complications are going to be worse than for Camus, I think. Um, and uh, obviously, we, we have no idea how we're going to cope with it, but this problem will last for more years than we can imagine. Um, I know, not, just for just making a few points there, but uh, it, it, I, I'm not, not saying we should be irreligious, but the, com the country that is irreligious is doing rather well uh, out of the rest of the world. Despite I, I, I would just caution despite about, its pandemic social media. I'm sorry? Despite its pandemic social media. I didn't understand that. Well, China and social media uh, um, are, are not strangers. No, but they control, their, so they control those social media. Oh, they absolutely. control how their people think in every way. Um, even through their eyes and their technology, they are way ahead of us. And they've also been incredibly smart in how they deceived and, and hoodwinked the Americans, but uh, many American big tech companies who through greed have um, really um, uh, uh, put themselves into a bit of a hole now, I'm afraid. And uh, the, I think the uh, Chinese Communist Party have played a very good hand um, in, in their two ways of dealing with the world, through Marxism and through capitalism. Um, and uh, we've got a real problem in, here in the West uh, and in the rest of the world, because they're also now capable, of course, through their economy to buy up, as we know, large tracts of, uh, um, of Africa, bits of uh, South America, our own country, for instance, Thames Water, is owned by the Chinese <laughs> and we are having our meters uh, fixed here and therefore there's there are going to be all kinds of controls that we're not going to be able to get out of very easily. Um, 
But anyway, that's nothing to do with the pandemic, but uh, the pandemic will become an, a very big advantage for, for China and a great disadvantage for us. I, I would caution about believing any statistics that come out of the Chinese Communist Party. Uh, I'd, I'd make that small point. Uh, we don't know really how bad mm. the uh, infection is in China. Um, they undoubtedly gave us the idea for lockdown, but their lockdown is a lot more fierce in Wuhan they were, they were putting policemen outside doors to keep people uh, in, inside. So they certainly locked down in, in that very effective way. Um, so we don't really, I don't think we really know the state of affairs in China. What we do know though, is that the places that have suffered worse have been Europe and, and America, particularly the larger cities, New York, London, place Brussels. They're, and they're all centers that have had a huge number of influx of foreign visitors very, very quickly at the time of the pandemic. And that never happened in the past. The, the, you know, the Black Death took 20 years to get to England from China. In, in, in. And, 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 and so it seems that the worst affected countries, almost bar none, have been the ones that have the largest populations and the most international links to the world. And can I tell you something? Um, because of my Italian experience uh, and because of um, how pandemics can spread, from 1348 to the present. They tend to spread through obviously trade. Now, in Northern Italy, uh, there are about 300,000 Chinese yeah. working in the sweatshop trade. Yes. And uh, a lot of um, them would have, actually some of them obviously didn't all come from Wuhan, but they came, they came into uh, uh, Northern Italy. And um, the, uh, the problem, really escalated there because there was a lot of a lot of people in the sweatshops and they couldn't be controlled now the problem was known by the italian state authorities seven ten years beforehand if you go onto the onto the internet you can see reuters reports about the problems of police were having with um the chinese community there because they never seemed to have any deaths they were covered up this is prior to the pandemic and uh, therefore we, we see the pandemic start in, in, in Europe, in Italy, through textile trade. Then, if you observe, the problems go to the other centers like Paris, London, New York, uh, or even Los Angeles. Uh, these, are, uh, these are the fashion world. And it's, 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 there's a kind of a textile um, connection, I feel, that came through the sweatshops. And um, that's my feeling. Uh, and, and of course, there was a, maybe a couple of months when we didn't know much about what was hitting us because we all thought it was flu. No, no. But in, in time, we then discovered it wasn't really flu. It was a, a vicious virus uh, with a mind of its own, which we're still trying to cope with. Um, but I think, uh, and the other aspect to, to, the, to, to China and Italy was that within a week of the pandemic hitting Northern Italy, there was a plane from China with all their medical people over to help the Italians. I found that rather interesting, um, and I won't go into, into great detail there, but that, that was, that's not happened to London, that's not happened to New York, that's not happened to any other country, not even happened to Berlin or Paris. The Chinese sent a plane full of medical help within one week to Northern Italy. Um, I think in time, maybe five, 10 years from now, we will we'll begin to understand how the pandemic started and how it spread properly. But those are my, my thoughts for, for what they are, uh, for the, what they're worth. Um, they're not really helping us at the moment. Well, it's highly infectious. I mean, we, we know that. And unfortunately, the, the current var uh, variants are even more infectious. It is highly infectious and, and it spreads very quickly. But it, it is different to the past where they were probably, Black Death is probably highly infectious. But, you know, it was one ship a year. I mean, so, you know, it took its time to get over. And that also came through, uh, by all accounts, from Venice, which again was a trading centre with yeah. China. Yes, of course, yeah. yeah. Mm. I mean, I think in future, we, you know, we are much, we now realize we're much more at risk from uh, the rapid spread of any virus. Um, and I think that although I pray almost uh, 
the normal to return, and I'm hopeful that it will, I think that there probably will be restrictions on travel going forward for some time. Um, because it is, I think, there's no doubt that it appears to be the main vector, the way it's spread very quickly around the world. And, and I think people are very scared, you know, about going back to unlimited, you know, how many flights go from London to New York every day? I mean, is it something like 300 or something or 60? I don't know, whatever it is, but all over the world. I think that that'll, that'll take a long time to come back. But, um, what about uh, Ed's point about leadership? I mean, leadership has been very different in, in, in different countries. Um, I mean, obviously, you've got the, um, the, the democratic countries versus the autocratic. And, you know, China's presumably a pretty autocratic kind of place. It's easier to marshal those things when, you're, when you've got a, um, an autocratic um, um, a state. Uh, but, um, you know, if you look around the world, I mean, the, it's all different. I mean, every country is doing something different. In fact, we're almost competing. I remember the, 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 the phrases that were being used in the UK, for example, we've got a world beating something or other, a world beating this we're working on. I mean, you know, it seems to me that there's been a kind of lack of international coordination about this, like we never knew this would happen, and that all the countries are kind of working differently. And isn't there a kind of, um, isn't that a good example of the lack of the common good feeling around the world that actually every country is kind of like, you know, we're, the European Union is going to stop its exports of vaccines because AstraZeneca, you know, isn't going to send as many, as much of the Oxford one to Europe as, as they were supposed to, even though the EU invested in, in the development of that. I mean, there's kind of a competitive thing going on, which is, which is not good, and, and a, a lack of international co cooperation, I think. Well, that's probably that's probably where the United Nations should step in. Um, <laughs> that's a thorny subject. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Is anybody else on the phone that hasn't had a chance to say anything? Have something that they want to talk? They want to say? Yeah. What about Peter Hirsch? He's normally got a lot to say. Or Bruno. What about you? Yeah, thanks, Ed, for the talk. Uh, I, I was quite interested in what you said earlier about Camus and whether or not he was a philosopher. And if you could go back to, to that distinction you made between writer, stroke artist and philosopher, um, I'd find that interesting. I didn't, I didn't quite take it all in. Yeah, so, <clears throat> so a lot of what I took where, where that comes from is- I have to uh, say something. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So, so a lot of where where that comes from, uh, Bruno, is uh, Camus in his uh, acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize for Literature. If you go and read that, um, it's it's a it's it's a, a it's a an essay on why it is that he didn't write things in the abstract. Okay. Um, he's definitely a person of a situation, and he reiterates in his notebook <coughs> that um, there is no sort of universality of things, that they, everything is contextualized and is localized in the sense that um, we can't, that, that it means, goes back to his, his argument with Sartre, right? I mean, ultimately. Uh, am I going to write things in the abstract or am I going to write about the human condition in a narrative form? And I think that that's where Camus, when we go back and we look at the, the existential philosophers of the day, he stands head and shoulders above the rest of them, in my mind, because of the way that he was able to describe the human condition in a narrative form. Um, now we find out that Sartre might not, might not even written, um, you know, his own works. So, um, the abstraction, the abstraction of, of what Camus wrote, we can talk about on, on, you know, in a group like this, but he wasn't interested in writing in that way at all. Mm -hmm. uh, and he makes it very clear in the Nobel Prize acceptance speech that he was a man of his times, of the condition that he was experiencing, and he wanted to change the world from the, the situation that he was put in. And the quote that the man that I would have been, that I could have been if I was not the man that I was, 
is something I think that resonates through his works. He's trying to describe things from the eyes of someone who is living in a very particular situation at a, at a very particular time. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Okay, I, I would like to say something. It's Peter Hirsch here. Hello. I'm in a way rising to the challenge because uh, I just heard uh, it said that I usually have something to say and I was a bit dis disadvantaged today because I was lecturing until 7.30 and I missed nearly all of the talk, which is a shame because it sounds as if it was extremely interesting. And I will listen to the recording when you send us the link. Um, my thought from the discussion is about altruism. Now, if you are going into a zone where people are shooting, you're probably well advised to put on a flat jacket to protect yourself. It's not too hard to figure out that, uh, you know, if I, if I wear a flat jacket, a flak jacket, it will reduce the probability of me being shot in the chest and killed. However, the mask in this present pandemic is the opposite. It is to protect other people. It, apparently, from what I've read, wearing a mask doesn't protect the wearer very much, but it stops anything I emit or reduces anything I admit being a danger to other people. And I wonder if that has got, I'm, I'm picking up just the theme I heard 10, 15 minutes ago. Uh, has that got an influence on the fact that uh, people are very reluctant to wear masks? I mean, I see them, I don't use public transport very much, but there's always someone who's either not wearing a mask at all, or they, they have a mask, but it's round their chin or something, you know, not doing any good at all. Just thought I'd take the conversation in a slightly different direction. What do people think? Well, it, it, it kind of, it, it is in the right direction. I mean, because alt altruism, because what, really what we're talking about is the, is the difference between individual um, versus feelings of collective. You know, people yeah. know, you know, whether <coughs> feel actually altruistic towards other people or whether they feel like they're, they're an individual and they're sort of you know, looking after themselves. And I guess wearing of a mask is kind of a symbol. I mean, we're back to deniers. People who are in denial um, about about uh, coronavirus probably don't wear masks. I guess, but I guess that's the, that's the way it is. But. Yeah, Peter, there was a quote in the in the presentation. There's three lengthy quotes uh, from the book that I didn't think could really be abstracted to Br to Bruno's point. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, things that Camus says are better said in a narrative style than you know distilled into some sort of philosophical concept. But the concept that does come out is that, you know, uh, there, it's not a collective of individual actions, um, but it's individual actions that are, make up the collective, right? And so there is one of the characters that say, it's my right to go home because I'm from Paris, whereas, and I don't really belong here. And, it, and, and it's a philosophical discussion that occurs between the main character and this character who I do a sort of a deep dive on. Um, and, it's a, and it's a good question because there is some truthfulness that, in that, right? That there, it is a collection of individual actions that, uh, that occurs, but which is more important in the, in the, in the, um, in the, in the sense of the town of Iran is a collection of people, not, not a collection of individuals making it. So uh, it's an interesting question. I don't, Camus obviously sides with the fact that we have to think about the other people more than ourselves. I mean, that's the way he's always thought. He's very consistent in all of his works. Okay, well, um, I suppose in many ways that thought has rather gone out of fashion. We famously live yeah, in a rather absolutely. society, <laughs> me, me, me. Um, solidarity is a word that's used, but people don't perhaps know what it really means. Right. No, I agree with you 100%. Camus has gone out of fashion in that sense. But I mean, think about it from this perspective. If the ultimate philosophical question is, because life is absurd, why don't I just kill myself? No, that would really be a selfish thing, right? 
the 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 brave thing to the, the brave thing to do is in the face of this absurdity is to act with courage and and that was what makes you human if i just went and killed myself that's an ultimately individual act right and i'm not you know i don't know anybody that committed suicide but it's a selfish thing in the sense that it harms other people can i say something about um sort of in altruism in relation to uh, autocratic and liberal societies. An autocratic society doesn't actually allow a person to consider being altruistic or learn to be altruistic or exercise their ability to be altruistic. While a liberal society, and perhaps our society has been too liberal or has been certainly accused, the government has been accused of being too lax or liberal, if you like, and yet we have had to make the effort to be altruistic, to think it through, to, to do it, to practice it. Um, I would have thought that was a, a very important aspect of liberal society. Could I make a comment there? Um, you know, one could argue that one could argue that it's the opposite. Insofar as in an autocratic society, you have a body or a group of people or a person deciding what's best for everybody. Whereas in a liberal society, you have individuals deciding what's best for themselves and having the flexibility or the ability to think in terms of other people as well. So it doesn't follow to me that, that a, 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 you know, a central, I don't know what you call it, do you call it a Politburo or, 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 or you know, a central illiberal society, a centrally controlled illiberal society is by definition um, uh, 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 going to be, um, you know, putting the, the 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 welfare of the group before that of the individual, and we see that in communist societies. So they are the, um, you know, they 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 are actually the, the least liberal societies, and they are also the most altruistic, because it's forbidden to think of the individual in those societies. <laughs> It's one way of looking at it, right? Mm. Yeah. Just Roland, I just wanted to say something again to change the subject about. Yes, about sorry, I was pondering what you were saying there. <laughs> you know, what you said about northern Italy. In fact, yeah. this week last year, we were driving back. We'd been skiing in the northeast of Italy, mm -hmm. driving along that road from Venice to Trieste, um, and you know Milan and uh, Torino and. Uh, um, um, <coughs> We, we had to stop off at the motorway. I was with my wife and two friends in the car. It took us three petrol stations before we could find a loo because every petrol station on that motorway had hundreds of buses. And in these buses were dozens of Chinese people. We couldn't get even get in the petrol station. They were, we, we just didn't know what was going on. There were hundreds, actually thousands of Chinese people. In, in fact, we had to leave the motorway and go to Bergamo, into the town, to find a cafe. And of course, Bergamo was the centre. It, 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 exactly, exactly. And what time of year was that? This was, it was, in fact, um, a, this, this time last year, you know, about a week. It was mid to late January. Right. Yeah. It was just, just remarkable. We, we didn't know what was going on. Were yeah. they tourists, Bruno? Do you know, we, we thought, God, they must be tourists. And someone observed yeah. That, Chinese um, New Year tourists. Sorry? Chinese yeah. New Year yeah, tourists. Year. Yeah. It would have been. Oh, I don't quite follow. How does that link up with Camus? No. <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. No, I just, I'm just going back to Roland's point about the Chinese in Northern Italy. <laughs> sorry. No, I just was looking for the link to Camus. <laughs> so. Well, but it's to do, to, obviously to do with the start of a, of a pandemic, an epidemic, mm. and how it spreads. Mm. And it spread through. In that case, I think through trade, through the textile industry, which Northern Italy uh, is very strong, and the Chinese influence there has been strong there for for many for, for, for decades. Because you may see something saying "made in Italy," but but actually, it's probably been finished in Italy, but made in China, and the, that that's ah. Uh. Um. Interesting. Hello. Yes, we can hear you. Yes. Uh, we, I've, I've 
it's disappeared here from my screen. Hello? Well, what's disappeared? Well, you've uh, you've disappeared from my screen. <laughs> well, I, I can hear you. <laughs> uh, we can see you. Uh, I've seen, I'm going to press back. Ah, no, back to the meeting. Um, no, all I was going to say is that, um, what was I going to say? Uh, the textiles, da 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 um, uh, yes, the, 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 the Chinese connection with Italy has been strong for decades, um, and particularly for, in the textile trade. Uh, 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 they, 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 the Italians can bump up the prices of their goods and make huge profits because it's been made in China and they stamp it made in Italy. And that's been going on for decades. And that's why you get hundreds of thousands of Chinese there. Yes, there was the Chinese uh, New Year at that time when Bruno, you were there. But obviously people were coming to and from China and therefore unknowingly, they were spreading the virus in, in, in Northern Italy where an awful lot of very elderly Italians <laughs> live. And, and, and a, a lot of the community, that people that died were very elderly people. And I, I was speaking to a friend in Italy at that time in Milan, and they were actually horrified because every minute a, a, an ambulance was coming into Milan and they were watching on television. And it was really, uh, and they immediately locked down. They immediately said, look, you can't go out of your, your home. Uh, if you want to go out, you need a, a, a permit that you, you, you take down from your computer and then you go out and the police stop you. Uh, they, you've got to show this. The Italians were very strong at that point. And they, I thought they almost had the, the answer, but then things got a little slack over the summer period and we're back to where we are now. And the situation in Italy is not good again. Um, because I think the virus changed. But the clue to this, in, in my, to my way, I think, is, is textiles. Um, because I think in the 1400s, the, 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 the plague came over with trade and with textiles, carpets, mm. things like this. Mm. Uh, anyway, I, I, I won't go over that ground again. Thanks. I just wanted to come back to one point uh, that Anne made at the beginning that she said thought it was a very depressing um, story and novel and and as we um, heard and learned and, and know that Camus is more a novelist than a philosopher or, or both. Um, I thought the novel was um, raising lots of points um, for us to think about. You know, we mentioned the various concepts of freedom and solidarity and um, um, compassion and empathy. Um, and you, Anne, thought it was also quite a depressing end. Um, I thought it was a more a, a French ending. Uh, very often uh, French novels and French films, they leave you to come to your own conclusions. I, I thought, um, even so people go back to normality again and, and the virus is lurking still somewhere. Um, I thought it was um, an open end for us to uh, draw our own conclusions. And I thought, um, we, I was hoping that uh, uh, the town and, and we learned something and, and that it actually wasn't such a, a dark end then one would like to think. <laughs> so I'm, I'm more optimistic about that ending, or at least I take it as an open French ending. I don't know if you feel the same, Anne. Yes, no, I didn't feel it a depressing ending. Ah. Um, oh, I see, you just saw no, the story. I felt was... it was quite uplifting. Actually. All right. Yeah, yeah, so I agree with you. Veronica, I was the one who was depressed. Oh, I see. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> but you're not anymore. And you, and you still are. are you? I still am. <laughs> uh. yeah, on the subject of um, depressed existentialists, <laughs> I, I, I majored in Sartre at university. There you and go. The, the view, uh, so I did a combined honors in philosophy and in French literature. And the view um, in, 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 the, the English camp, philosophy camp, was that Sartre wasn't a philosopher. You know, they hated him. And it was very unusual for anyone to be studying him. The French felt that um, Camus was a, um, a, a philosopher more than Sartre. No one liked Sartre, actually. I just happened to have um, 
the head of the philosophy department had written a book on Sartre. I was lucky enough to have you know one-on-one -on -one tutorials with him. My feeling was that Sartre was a philosopher and a poor novelist. I didn't enjoy his novels, but Camus, I thought, was a great novelist, but he wasn't a philosopher the way the British expect their philosophers to be. He wasn't a technical philosopher. But I remember at the time, we, you know, we, we were given one day a, a whole load of headlines from newspapers, and it says, existentialist jumps to his death. And you read the article and you know, you read this guy had discovered existentialism, realized that the world had no meaning, so <laughs> jumped off the roof of a building. And I thought, wow, if the world has no meaning, you can create it. You, you're free to choose your own meaning. What a liberating you know, way of thinking. So, so you know, to paraphrase a lot of thought processes that went on through that, I came out of that course thinking, you know, I'm an existentialist and it's actually close to Buddhism insofar as you don't have your values dictated to you by a church or a state or by other people. You're free to choose the values according to which you want to, according to how you want to live your life. And that's actually phenomenally liberating, I think. So the yeah. whole thing, existentialism equals pessimism, I just don't buy into. I think it means freedom and responsibility. That's my way of looking at it. Hmm. Definitely freedom is a theme in, in Camus, right? I mean, it's a major theme, right? Mm -hmm. How do major you achieve theme. freedom if, you, if freedom is through rebe rebellion? Mm -hmm. um, it's this idea that, um, uh, that I like the idea, Ed, that um, Camus and Sartre didn't like each other and that, and that one is, a, one is a, a novelist and the other one is a philosopher that, and that uh, Camus doesn't think he's a philosopher, but he writes very good novels about human nature and the nature of the human condition. And some of the characters in, in the plague are, are amazing um, and, and very different. And it's, you, you kind of, um, you get the sense that um, he is kind of arguing for uh, against exist, existentialism in that way. He's arguing for, for a, more of a common good, more of a, a community welfare. Um, and is it Rombert who says that's the that's the uh, public welfare is the is the collection of individual welfares? But but actually, is it in that sense? As far as Cameron is concerned, he's saying that. But I think he's putting that up as a proposition to be shot down. That's right. He disagrees with them. You're right. Yeah. Well, perhaps it, it, in your tenure as chairman, you could put on a different persona every meeting, and you could pretend to be a, a, a Camus type of person and then you could put on a Sartre and then you could do a bit of Wittgenstein. You can probably clothe yourself in a different personality each time since you have the knowledge of all these characters. Well, it's interesting you say that, David, because uh, I was taking a class on Wittgenstein and our professor at the beginning of the class said, listen, uh, I don't care if you agree with Wittgenstein. I could care less. He said, but when you walk out of this class, I want you to be able to see the world through Wittgenstein's eyes. So that's the only thing I care about. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, maybe we could maybe we could pick a different novelist, philosopher, whatever you want to call it, every time, and say, here's how, you know, I don't Wittgenstein saw the world, something like that, you know, through one of one of the books. I don't know. Um, I think it's much better to have a dialogue that we're having now rather than listening to, you know, an hour long winded conversation. You know, like I said, if you want to listen to somebody talk to you, you can turn on the television anytime you want or get on the Internet. There's a million YouTube videos that you could watch. But having this sort of interacting where we're talking about the different themes that are raised and, and adding personal experiences, I think, is much more fruitful than than just uh, listening to somebody talk. Yeah, yeah. It's different. It's a different medium, right? It's hard to do that this way. In person, you could do that a lot easier. Mm. Now, I, I think, Mark, um, well, and Ed, I don't think you, you want this to be a, a book club, really. But I think <laughs> I, I, I like the idea of, of, of following philosophical novels. I think that's a great way, a, a great lead into a discussion. Can we start with Les Mouches then next time? I didn't understand it the first time round and I'm sure no one can explain it to me either. <laughs> Getting the feeling that actually there's an awful lot of people, English people, who read um, the original um, 
particularly French novels some 40 years ago and didn't really understand them. And then, you know, that's, that's, and that has never really gone back to them. So if you read, a lot of people have said they read, you know, La, La Peste in French when they were at university. And you know, that didn't really kind of get on with it all that. I don't know, um, in terms of, you know, what, we, what we're trying to do is we're trying, it's not about learning about phil philosophy, that it's about learning from each other. I mean, actually, that's the idea, is that there's an awful lot of knowledge. I mean, you know, I think Bruno's contribution was fantastic. I think the, there's an enormous potential to, uh, to learn, Veronica as well. I mean, there's an enormous potential to learn um, about human nature and philosophy in that way from other people. So that's the... Yeah, that's where I'm coming from, anyway. But uh, I think if you keep the book, I think if you keep the book short enough, it, it's and manageable. I think you would, you would, you can generate conversations like this, right? So, for example, on this point, if you were to read Dostoevsky, right, I would say notes from an un, from the underground, right? That's like a hundred and ninety page novella, right? Instead of reading some major work. One of the reasons why I have always been attracted to Camus is that he's able to say things succinctly, right? He's not, and I don't want to offend anybody, Charles Dickens, right? He doesn't spend 10 pages describing the room that you're in, right? I get it after about a paragraph, okay? I want to get on to something a little, a little bit different. So if you were going to have a book club you would have to read A Christmas Carol and not Oliver Twist, right? Or, you know, Dostoevsky's, you know, again, Notes from the Underground is a, is a wonderful explanation of his philosophy in a very short novella, right? I don't need to read Crime and Punishment or The Brothers Karamazov or, you know, one of these Herculean efforts to understand what the person's trying to say. You know, that's just what could be an approach. Well, it was Oscar Wilde who said, uh, apologize for writing a long letter. He didn't have time to write a short letter. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, well, I think um, we ought to become a theatre uh, club because uh, I, I would predict, if you can make any prediction, when the normal, whatever that is, returns, I think that this play will probably be put on the London stage quite soon. <laughs> <laughs> so we ought to, if it does, we ought to all go, to, uh, go and see it. So, Ed, you wouldn't like... Um... I mean, I would have a controversial suggestion because there's one novelist and philosopher who actually I think is, a, is not a good novelist and not a good philosopher, <laughs> but is phenomenally provocative. And her books are only very long. And that's to go back to Ava's point, who talked about altruism, Ayn Rand and her Atlas Shrugged. Okay. Oh, yes. Now, oh, if Anthem anyone notices Ed's face Anthem. there. Sorry? Anthem is short. Yes, but, but Atlas Shrugged has, has you pacing the room and hurling the book at the wall. Yeah. Because whether or not you agree with her ideas, it is idea laden and it's phenomenally controversial. No and question. actually, I get the impression that half of the voters in the US have that book by their bedside at the moment. No doubt. Yeah, but uh, Anthem is a short version of her thought. So if you read that, yeah. you don't have to read you know, the, 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 low, the longer stuff. But yeah, there, most authors do have a short version of what they think, believe it or not. I mean, when you think about it, when you step back and start to think about it, they condense it into a, a, a shorter version because not everybody is gonna slog through the longer stuff. But yeah, I get your point. That would be a very controversial author to talk about. Mm -hmm. No question, especially, do we have any architects on the, on the, in, in the room here? Um, not, not here, I don't think, no. I think of her often as I walk through Wimbledon and look at some of the new houses that have gone up. <laughs> oh, God. What would she say about that, you know? <laughs> Plenty to say. Well, you wonder whether they're actually designed by architects for a start. <laughs> no, but I think that's the point, that um, it's not a question of looking at a book by any particular person. It's, it's a question of adopting that, that personality, and that would great imagination i think it would would be wrong to take a book and study it because as, as somebody says that would be like a book club but i say we rely on you Ed, to give the lead and you you could you could as i say clothe yourself uh, even with a bit of poetic license uh, and give a lead um, as if you were that person that, that's the point nothing to do with the books it's just being that person that's why my 
my suggestion. Um, I strongly disagree. <laughs> it's <laughs> not a theatre club, is it? You know, I'd like to discuss various um, uh, <laughs> philosophical con uh, concepts, like, you know, it would be good to carry on with the ones we mentioned, um, like, you know, freedom or altruism, or, or uh, and in the past we had discussed democracy and so on. And sometimes it's good to have a, a, a book or something to attach it to, isn't it? I'm not um, suggesting that Ed yes. dresses up as Jean-Paul Sartre and you dress up as Simon de lovely, yeah. lovely, no, I'm not suggesting that. The lovely example of uh, the good thing about marriage, you know, husband and wife. Uh, yes. it's, it's called Chuck's, it's called Chuck's the position. Counteracting <laughs> each other. But I mean, also, I think David was giving us a wonderful illustration of the absurd, or you know. An yeah, absolutely. I fully agree there. Attempted <laughs> absurdity, Aww. which as which yes. as Ed, which as Ed said, was is something which, if you go down that route, you might end up wanting to commit suicide as the only so the only mm -hmm. that, that. Well, the group certainly would. <laughs> as long as you didn't throw yourself out of, of a building. But you don't want to do you don't want to do that, of course. So, oh, hi, hi, Sarah. You waiting? Hi, Sarah. Um, I just picking up on Veronica's thoughts about picking up on some of the ideas. I was very interested to hear Bruno Noble, in the same breath, use the words freedom and responsibility. And I'd love to have an opportunity to understand that more in, in some future date because it seems to me they're very hard. To put those two things together, if we under if we all agree what the definition of freedom is and the definition of responsibility, and I actually mm. do think that in the plague, that is addressed in part um, more to do with the freedom than the responsibility bit. But I think it came out when people started to um, act in a collective manner or for the collective good, perhaps I should say that that was then taking on some form of responsibility. But it does seem to me that there is a tension between freedom, individual freedom and responsibility. And I'd love to hear more about that at some stage. Mm. Was that nausea, nausea? Is that what you have to bring to the table, Bruno? Nausea. No, sure, sure. oh, no. I, I wouldn't want to no. revisit that, frankly. <laughs> you wouldn't wish that on anyone you said? <laughs> I just wouldn't want to revisit it. No, one <laughs> no, it's so difficult, isn't it? I bought it, but uh, yeah. Not as bad as Les Mouches, come on. <laughs> what is this book you're talking about? Les Mouches, The Flies, one of Sartre's. Uh, I don't know this one. Oh, yes, uh -huh. I remember. Another I read it long, long ago. Another Plague. Okay. You know it, Bruno? Um, yeah, I, I, don't, I don't recall if I've read it. I had to read Being and Nothingness. So maybe we could read that by next week. No one can read that. No, I've, I, I, I read bits of it. I can't lay claim to have read that in its entirety. Is that a good time to uh, to wrap up, Ed, and um, to thank you for your excellent presentation, and to thank everybody for um, um, some fantastic contributions. It was really re very enjoyable. Thanks very much, Ed. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Thank very you. Much. Very good. Yes, good. Yeah. good oh, and, yes. and thank you very much for what you sent us, the little blue book of the common good. Yes. I find it fascinating. Mm -hmm. Very, very interesting. Thank you so much. Well, well, Leslie forwarded that to me, so everybody should have it in their mailbox. It's a it's a revise it's a revision, right? So mm. yes, there's there's additional contact in the content in yes. there. Yes, I like I love the content. Thank you. Yes, thank you very much. Okay, thank you for having you. me. If anybody has any questions, you know, you can always send me an email um, and we can, you know, if we need to have a continued conversation, maybe we can do that. Great, thanks, Ed. Oh, very good. I do we'll think do we need to continue. Thank you very much. Bye. We need to continue. Bye. 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 Mark, will you be doing Bye. Bye. notes on uh, the Bye. website? All right. Will you be putting the notes on Ed's talk on the website? Yes. Yeah, 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 yeah we'll look at that. Yeah, okay. I have the recording and I will put the, uh, I will put the, I, I think I might just put the lecture up there too. Yeah, good idea. All right. Thanks, Ed. Really good. Thank really you. Good. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, Thank everyone. you very much. Bye-bye. Bye now. <laughs>